All right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, first things first, welcome to our meetup. I'm very glad that you were able to join and that you found our URL. This is going to take a little bit between the Zoom and um, between the actual YouTube stream. So what I would like to know now first is if you can hear me well, if you can see me well now. Um, so please just let me know. So please just type in the chat if you're able to hear me and if you're able to see me as well. So then we can start. Um, I commented it on the meetup. Ah, wait, no. So I commented the link. I don't know if we want to maybe um, add it to the description of the page. So hello, everyone. Okay, great. So video and audio works. Um, thank you, Eduardo and Johanna and Barbara and uh, me, CC87. <laughs> I'm very glad to see you today. We can start officially. Um, so we prepared uh, some nice things for you today, but you might be wondering if this is my living room, which looks so nicely and I'm totally in the middle of the city. So cheers from Munich. Um, but this is actually not my living room. We have a very nice hostess that has been following us for a while and she's hosting us tonight for the second time. Um, so please give it up for Nina. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> All right. So hello, Nina. I'm so glad that we have you here. Um, this is the second time that you're hosting us by yeah. Ladies Munich here. Uh, last time, maybe some of our viewers remember to be um, in Jambi. But now um, we're in a new company. And so are you. This is Alasco. And um, well, I don't know. Before, you, I know you have prepared some nice words about Alasco and even some nice tips she will tell you more about later. But before we do that, I have to ask, why do you keep inviting us? I just love the thought of um, Pi Ladies and all the initiative, and I want to support you just like that. <laughs> Thank you. You definitely are one very cherished supporter of Pi Ladies Munich. <laughs> all right. So as I said before, uh, Nina um, prepared some nice tips on a very hard task, I think, um, these days, uh, which is something that she successfully managed to do also during lockdown. And this is how to get a job in the middle of a pandemic. So I know that you started at Alaska um, in the middle of lockdown, right? So yeah. how was that for you? Um, were you now we're sitting on the offices, but yeah. before you were home, how was that for you? Yeah, it was really a strange situation because you get to know everyone by video and you don't have um, the people in person. You don't get the culture um, yeah, by heart, but um, actually it went pretty well. So I had a smooth onboarding, but of course it is still a bit strange situation, I guess, for everyone. Definitely. Well, then um, I'm sure not only uh, that you have very good tips, not only on how to find a job, but then also on the onboarding side. Yeah. If you have more questions, well, first, I'm very glad that you tuned in because now Nina is going to um, say a few words about all of this. And if you have any questions later for her, please just feel free to, uh, to put them on the chat. Um, it might take a little bit until we see them, but just feel free um, to post them and we will um, get to them later. So Nina, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, I thought it might be a nice idea to give you some advice during this um, pandemic situation as it is not really easy to find a new job. Some of you might have lost um, theirs or also friends of mine, they didn't um, pass their probation period because uh, the economic situation is really insecure. So um, my tips, um, first of all, I would like you um, yeah, to use your free time and also um, do some training certificates and also online courses, maybe to, to just be better than your competitors in applications. And the next thing is, um, of course, you look for jobs um, online. 
And once a company of, um, has a job advert, um, I think they are hiring. Why do I stress out that? Because um, many applicants reached out to me, called me and um, asked, Nina, are you hiring um, all your job adverts? And I was like, yes, of course. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't publish them. So if you find adverts, it might be a good sign the company is um, also hiring. Um, then, um, yeah, you might have to look for very different job titles, such as um, if you're looking for a developer job, maybe um, use some synonyms like software engineer, software consultant, programmer, um, but also scrum master, software architect, use um, yeah, a lot of synonyms and you might um, reach more results than only um, looking for a developer job. Um, then also you can, um, of course, use LinkedIn and Xing to build up a professional network. Um, as soon as you have a profile there, and maybe even recruiters will reach out to you and offer you a suitable job. So um, this is also a good opportunity. And um, furthermore, um, there are recruitment agencies and headhunters. So uh, for candidates, it's often free of costs. So you can just um, tell them you're looking for a job and tell them what you want to do, which companies you like. And um, yeah, they will reach out to companies, send your profile, do some first interviews. And um, a friend of mine, she even told me she had three interviews due to this agency. It didn't work in the end, but it's a good opportunity to improve your chances as well. Um, then, of course, you can also tell your friends, your former colleagues and use their networks as well, because uh, yeah, connections is always a good um, opportunity. And I would invite you also to use those connections. So if you have a company you're interested in and some one you know works there just let them know that you want to apply because many companies have referral programs and they have the policy to um, give every referred candidate the interview um, a chance to get an interview so you might increase your chances as well when you are getting referred by someone working there um, Furthermore, um, yeah, write as many applications as possible, maybe rethink your requirements as well, be open for something you might, um, yeah, you didn't consider before that might be um, also um, increasing your chances. Um, furthermore, you can send unsolicited applications, so um, you never know when the economic situation of a company is getting better and once you are already in the talent pool, they might contact you as soon as they have a new uh, position and um, already reach out to you before they even publish their job. So an uh, unsolicited application for a company you're in interested in is a very good idea. Um, yeah, what I want to tell you is also prepare well um, for the job interview as uh, the competition is higher nowadays because there are less open jobs and um, you have to be prepared well and you want to leave a good impression um, for this employer. And yeah, the last thing, um, make sure you have a suitable environment um, during your video interview, because currently everything is remote and video based. Make sure you have a good um, internet connection and also don't do this interview during a car drive or during um, a walk, because I had those situations and it's not professional when you get distracted the whole time. You can't take notes, you're um, not in a professional environment, so um, that's yeah, the, the advice I want to give you when you are already invited. And yeah, last not, but not least, um, Alasco is hiring as well. We are a software company. We want to digitize the uh, construction industry with our software. And um, actually um, the pandemic, um, yeah, could be an, um, uh, also yeah, have a positive impact for us because people um, need tool support and the construction industry is very old fashioned and we want to digitize it. And um, yeah, if you're interested in job opportunities, for example, um, we are looking for junior, senior and lead engineers with Python, with JavaScript and React, just reach out to me or um, yeah, go to our website, alasco.de. Thank you so much for having me and I would love to answer your questions as well. All right, thank you so much. Um, let me check if we can see already something in the questions for us. Um, 
I see someone had some trouble with the browser, but also <laughs> Laisa and Naomi came to rescue. I hope this is working well now. Um, all right, so other than that, uh, thank you so much, Nina. And um, yeah, so if you wanna, uh, if you wanna consider taking a new job opportunity on these times, um, or if you are looking for something, keep in mind all that Nina, you, uh, Nina just told you. And if you are looking for someone uh, for some interesting job with very cool colleagues, and if you wanna work with nice people like Nina, now you know who you're gonna call. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, so let's continue. And for our meetup tonight, we also have um, two very interesting topics. The first has to do with objects. And for this, we have um, a, great, um, a great speaker that I want to introduce to you. This is, uh, well, an awesome Pi lady, a speaker, she's a teacher and a co-founder co of Transcode. And she is today joining us from very far away. So thank you so much for joining. Um, Naomi, can you please um, start your video? Okay, great. Okay. It's very nice to have you. Uh, so first of all, again, I would just ask the audience if you're able to see and to hear Naomi well, please leave a comment if this is the case. Um, all right, but in the meantime, we can already do, um, I have some stuff to ask you. So I think everyone's curious okay. today, right now. Um, where are you joining from? Uh, I am in uh, Chicago right now. I, I live close to downtown. All so, right. Yeah. Okay, that's really good. So you do have the living room in the middle of the city. <laughs> I I do actually. I, I actually have a shop from our front porch that has the whole Chicago skyline, but it's, it's a little bit much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I'm very glad that you were able to join to, uh, today and also from all the way from Chicago. I think it's the middle of the day for you. So thank you so much for yep. using your lunch break to speak with us. We're very excited to have you. Um, all right. So I have another question for you. I would like to know what is your favorite thing about the Python community? Uh, that's a good question, I suppose. Um, I think it's, um, in general, the fact that uh, Python community over the years has really tried to be uh, inclusive and welcoming. And while we're maybe not as, as far as we, we will want to be eventually, I think it really has been a, a, a very positive thing that um, most people feel welcome coming into it. And I guess my favorite thing is um, that now I can travel to almost any place in the world and find Python people that maybe I haven't met before, but we can still talk and we still have something in common. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a long time since I've been in Munich, for example, but now I'm, now I'm, 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 I'm missing every place that I've ever been. I would love to come back. <laughs> oh yeah. I, Really hope that um, that the situation gets better soon, and then we can have you in Munich. Please do tell us if you come to oh, Munich yeah. as well. We would love to have you on site and to have you for some beer in case you also want like to drink yes. beer over here. Well, then it's settled. <laughs> then there only you go. let us know, please. Um, yeah, so that's really cool. I also love the Python community, and you're right. I think it's still a long way to go, but. Um, we have already achieved some, and this is also in a big part um, due to people like you, uh, like a founder of Codrens. Uh, so this is a huge thing. Um, if you feel, if you in the audience uh, also feel fond of these initiatives, please feel free to support. Um, come be a speaker at our meetups. Uh, be a host if you're in Munich or if you know other. Um, groups like Pi Ladies um, all on other parts of the world or other organizations that are supporting diversity in the um, open source or any code environment. So uh, this is great. I just wanted to say that. Uh, but now everyone is really excited, I think, to see what you have prepared for us. Um, so please give an applause from the audience to Naomi. And uh, Naomi, the stage is all yours. Okay, uh, sharing my screen now. 
So that should be there. And uh, if anything looks horrible, let me know and we'll make see what we can do to make it work. Uh, so uh, I want to talk today, uh, I call this talk objects all the way down. Uh, what I've been doing a lot lately, I've, I've been doing Python for nearly 20 years. And one thing I've found is that um, there are a lot of concepts where people think they know what they are but they don't always really know. It's not always really what they think. So I've, I've been doing a lot of work that way. I did some Twitch streams earlier in the year and I'm working on a, a, a sort of a text and video project for my publisher, exploring some of the fundamental things that people tend not to really understand. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, and if you're interested, this is a Jupyter Notebook. I'm, I'm using it in presentation mode, but it's just a Jupyter Notebook and it should be available uh, at the link there, uh, GitHub naming and Cedar Workshops. Uh, it, it should be one of them there. Uh, I'll show this at the end as well. And of course, uh, I can be found uh, online uh, at uh, naomicedar.tech or Twitter is at Naomi Cedar. So um, let's go ahead and get started then with the question, what is an object? In Python, we are fond of saying everything is an object. Well, what does that mean? Well, so when I'm talking about something being an object, I would expect it to have a few things be true about it. So one of those things would be that it is an instance of a subclass of object. Object is the class that everything is supposed to inherit of. So uh, an object in the generic sense should be some instance of something that goes back to the class object. And that means it's going to have certain things true about it. It's going to have special methods, the, the dunder methods with the double underscores. It's going to have um, an ID number so that you can identify that particular object, a unique ID. Uh, and of course, it will be created when its code is executed. Uh, a lot of times that means when the program loads, but um, doesn't necessarily have to mean that. So in addition to wanting to know what is, uh, should I say, the truth about what you're doing, why, why would we want to care about whether it's an object or not? Well, only objects are going to be something that you can assign to a variable. And objects can be both parameters and return values of functions. If you don't have an object, you can't do any of these things. If you do have an object, even though you might not be expecting it, you can do all of these things. So. I'm going to start really simple here and bear with me. Uh, the answers to these questions are not completely and totally obvious. Uh, they would not be true for all programming languages. So I'm going to start with a constant. So if we have something like the word hello as a string, in our code floating around somewhere. Maybe it's by itself, maybe it's a doc string, maybe it's, it's used for a variable, but just this hello by itself, is that an object? And you know, I, I, I want you to think about that a little bit. And then the question is, does this string floating around naked, does it have methods and attributes? And is it a subclass of object? That's what we want to find out. So I can do a few experiments to, to find out. And this is the way that I like to go. I like to kind of work through these experiments and I encourage you to get in the habit of doing your own experiments. Uh, quite often when I have a question about something in Python, uh, I go to a shell or a Jupyter notebook and I start experimenting to see if I can understand the thing. So first thing I would do is just do type. Uh, and it tells me that Hello is a string, okay. That doesn't really answer my question, is it an object? But there is in Python a function is instance. And if you ask is instance is something, uh, an instance of something else, uh, it will tell you. So here I again put in my bare string hello. And 
object, which is, as I say, that the, the, the generic built-in class object. And I just want to know, is, this, is hello an instance of object? It is. So by definition, this bare string is an object. Okay, that, that's kind of good to know. Uh, and uh, that means that it's got a bunch of attributes. And I think sometimes, uh, particularly if you come from other languages, uh, this is a little bit of a surprise. I mean, what? Uh, so here we go. If this is just a string, it's not doing anything, and it's got a full range of uh, special methods or dunder methods, as we like to call them. Uh, and it's got all of the things that you can do with any string. Okay, well, that's good to know. And again, this wouldn't be true in every language or every implementation. Um, I started a long time ago as a C programmer and C, this would not be true at all. Uh, in, you know, in various languages, uh, this would not be necessarily an assumption you can make, but it's the way it works in Python. And then finally, you know, I saw in that whole list of Dunder things that there is a Dunder class method. And we're gonna use this a little bit because it tells me what class it is. So I can go ahead and do that and see, yes, it's a string. And um, in fact, it doesn't matter whether or not it's assigned to a variable or not. All of the Python literals like int, float, and string those are all objects. So if you see the number one in a Python program, it's going to be an object. Uh, if you see a float 10.0, that's also going to be an object. A string like hello, whether it's a doc string or whatever it's doing, those are also all objects. They're not just some sort of constant that is just that thing and has no machinery associated with it. They are regular Python objects. Okay, but Let's, let's make it a little bit weirder. What about true, false, and none? Are those objects, methods, attributes, are they in fact subclasses of object? Well, again, let's do some experimenting. So I can find out the class of true. Okay, now this tells me a couple things. First of all, its class is bool, that's good. Secondly, uh, it, it must be, it has the dunder methods. It has special methods like class, special attributes. That's, that's good to know. Uh, and then we can go ahead and ask the question, is it an object really? And it is. Now there's something about Booleans in Python, true and false, that people don't always appreciate. And that is, here I'm going to ask if true is an integer. Okay, now this is one of these things where I would really like to take a few minutes and get people's feedback and get people to commit themselves. We got kind of a short uh, time frame, so I'm not going to do that. But I want you to, do, to, to, in your mind, frame your answer. Is true an integer? Okay. And the answer is yes. True and false in Python, the Boolean types are actually subclasses of int. Uh, so that false is really lurking behind the scenes a zero and true is really a one. Uh, this can really surprise people if they think that true is some magic value that is always out there and unchanging and whatever. You know, really any integer other than zero is true uh, and uh, zero is false. And this means when you try comparing two different Booleans, they both might be true, but they might not. They might not be the same value. Uh, so this is something that you need to be a little bit aware of. And you can experiment with it and you can do true and false. You can add true plus true and it'll give you two and things like that. Lots of fun stuff here. But uh, as I say, this is one of these basic things where people think they know what they, that what's going on. And then they're sort of a little bit surprised like, oh, this doesn't work at all. Okay, so true, false, they're objects. Now, what about none? 
There is, I will promise you this, there is only one none in, in Python. When you're running a Python program, there is only one none. Uh, but is it a class? Is this an object? Is this an instance of a class? If this is an instance of a class, is it inherited from the magic object, the mother of all classes? Well, again, think of what your answer would be if we were together in person and we could spend time sort of getting people to commit yourself. Okay. So the class of none is a special class none type. That doesn't answer the object question exactly, although it looks like it might be an object. So let's ask that question explicitly. Is none an object? Yes. But as I say, there is only one none object accessible in your Python code at any time. So that means when you're comparing for none, uh, if you want to find out if something is none, you would never use the double equals. Instead, you use is. You can say, is this none? Because there's only ever going to be one none. And same thing if you're checking for not, you can check if it is not none. Uh, so that is, is a, 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 another thing to know. So really literals of all types, even including Booleans and, 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 and none, those are all objects. So that's, that's kind of the easy stuff. Now let's get a little bit more, as we say, meta. Uh, objects are instances of classes which are by definition subclasses of object. So are classes objects? That is the class themselves, not the instances. Are classes objects? And again, in a lot of languages, the answer would be no way. Uh, if you think about, say, for example, Java, Java has classes all over the place. Uh, you can't treat classes as though they're objects. They're, they're not. They're, they're different. C++, same thing. So again, let's, let's do some experimenting. So I made a class, my class, and it's got just a little simple dunder init function, and that's about it. And I can do that, and it it does its thing. It compiled without an error. That's always good when you're doing a live demo, by the way. Uh, and I ask what class it is, uh, my, my object, and it says it's my class. So yeah, that's what I've done. I made an instance of my class. And we know, we would expect, rather, that my object here, the instance, we would expect if we do this that we're going to get a true, right? And we do. And um, let me see here. Yep. There we go. Well, why are we? There we go. Okay. But now, what about the class itself? So, does a class have a class? Hmm. Again, Best way to find out is to try it. So if I try it, I ask what class my class is and I get back type. Interesting. And this is because in fact, in Python, um, class and type really are the same thing. They're different words, you use them in different situations, but it's the same concept. It's the same thing we're talking about. A class is a type, a type is a class. And that's kind of proven here, okay? But what's the answer to this? Again, uh, I'd like to take more time, build a little bit more drama, but uh, let's keep moving. I want you to think in your own mind what do you think is coming next? Is my class an instance of object true or false? Okay, well, there is only one way to find out. So in fact, yes, when you have a class definition and that code executes, it creates the class as an object in your code. 
Okay, now wait a minute. We said earlier you could do things with an object. Okay, so can I assign my class to a variable? Uh, like this, make X class uh, be the same thing as my class. And if I do, what happens when I try to make a new instance with it? Will this work? Hmm. Well, again, let's think about it. I mean, this could be an error. I, I, I occasionally put in things that, that throw errors just for the heck of it. So you don't know. Uh, but let's see what happens here. Okay. So when I used X class, my variable, it really referred to the object that it was set to point to, which was the class, and it made an instance of the class. So, yeah, classes are objects. You can, you can use them, uh, you can assign them to variables, you can pass them as parameters, you can get them back as, as return values. They are objects. Okay, and here I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So can I use this as, yes, I can. I can go ahead uh, and do that uh, and pass it to my echo function, which prints it out and I get the same answer. So, um, or wait a second. Yeah, so uh, that also works just fine. Okay, now here, this is one that I've actually been playing with a little bit lately. Uh, and um, I'll be giving a little bit more of a talk on it uh, at uh, PyCon S, PyCon España, uh, in an, um, I guess it's about a month and a half or something like that. Uh, slices, we know about slices, right? We have a, a list, like say zero to nine, uh, and we can use a single index to get a single item, or we can use slice notation to get some sublist of the, the, the sequence, right? So if I do that, I hear the last one is the only one we're showing output for. If I do slice uh, colon to negative five, it will get me all of the items from the beginning uh, up to, but not including the fifth one from the end. One, two, three, four, five, so up to five, uh, it will get me all of the items up there, which is what it's done, zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, so slices are cool. Everybody likes slices. And you can do all sorts of other fun things. You can count backwards, you can you know, adjust the step value and go different ways. So it, it, they're, they're really fun. Uh, so I wanna know though, what happens with that colon notation? What is going on there? So again, let's do an experiment. Here I've made a subclass of list. I call it my list. And the only thing different is I have overridden the get item, the dunder get item method, which is what gets called when you use the square brackets, uh, so that it prints out what it was given as an index. And then it goes ahead and just calls the the parent class to do the stuff it would do normally. So this works absolutely the same as a list, except it prints out whatever it is we put in square brackets. Okay, so I make an example of my list with the same zero to nine, and then I just print out what index one would be. So I just wanna see if the regular stuff works. Single item works fine. I wanted index one, zero, one, that's a one, it's all ones, it all works. Okay, cool. Now though, I'm gonna give it a slice and I wanna see what it tells me that is. So I'm gonna start at zero, I'm going to stop before element five and I'm gonna go by twos. Okay, so what does it think? What does Python think that notation and adds up to, okay? Well, so first of all, you can see I got my right answer. I started at zero, went by twos, 
zero, two, four, stop before five. So zero, two, four, that's right. But notice that what it thought I gave it was this, a slice zero, five, two. Okay, I mean, zero, five, two, that's understandable. Those are the things in, in uh, between the colons, but um, rather than uh, it parsing it any other way, it looks like by the time the call actually happened, this notation was turned into this thing. So let's look at that thing a little bit more. Well, let's try another example and just make sure it works. Um, see, and that one works too. This time I'm starting at index two, stopping before seven, same thing. So yeah, it works. So, um, um, oh, and wait a second, before I go on too much further, there is a question, let me just knock that off real quick. Is it valid in both Python 2 and 3 that literals and classes are objects? And that is true in both Python 2 and 3, except in Python 2, there are also things called old style classes. And old style classes, I don't think actually follow that rule. So having said that, don't do Python 2, do Python 3, come on. Uh, but I know there's, there's lots of leg legacy code base and things out there too. But yeah, that, that was one of the things that people didn't like about old style classes, in fact, and why they went to new style classes. It wasn't consistent. Okay, so back to slicing. Um, so I can also, it turns out there's a slice function in Python that will create slice objects. So I can do exactly the same thing I did before. And that is I can, I can kind of reverse the process and say, okay, I want to slice starting at zero, stopping before three, and we're going to advance one by one. So I do that and it makes the matching slice. Okay. Now here's something. I've got this slice object. Can I use it with the list? Would that work? Again, make your, make your guess, um, but uh, in fact, I'll show you, it works, it works just fine. And this actually does have an implication if you are doing some particular type of slice that you do over and over and over again. And this might be something where you want to get every other element out of a list or tuple or something like that. You could, in fact, make that slice in advance and store it as a variable and then just use it by name. So you could do something like even slice equals slice um, zero, um, actually be zero, none, uh, two. And you could use that to get the even elements out of a list with all sorts of lists and your code might be a little bit more readable. I don't see a lot of people doing that, but it's certainly possible. Okay, so slice has a class. Is it an object? I think you already understand that it, it probably is, okay? Um, and actually back to uh, the questions, uh, is this to be considered an advantage or disadvantage? I assume by the this we mean uh, the fact that everything is an object. And uh, I suppose there's a certain room for opinion. In my opinion, I think in most people's opinion, uh, this consistency actually is usually considered to be an advantage. Uh, it allows you to do all sorts of things in terms of uh, introspection. If you need to um, do various things to the code once it's been created, um, it, it adds a lot of flexibility that this is consistent. Uh, on the other hand, if you're really paranoid and worried about people messing with things, uh, which would be, you know, honestly, the way that Java tends to look at things, we don't want you doing where you don't want to be, uh, then you know, maybe a Java programmer would take the opposite view. But for most Python programmers, yeah, it, it is actually considered to be an advantage. Uh, okay, so, so yes, yeah, slices are objects. They are created whenever you use a colon inside of um, square brackets. 
And you can also, as I showed you, create them with slice. So that's good. Now, functions, um, are they objects? Uh, well, here's a function and it works. And its class is, wait for it, function. Uh, and is it an object? By now, I hope you're guessing yes. Okay, functions are objects as well. They have all sorts of dunder attributes. They have a dunder doc thing where you can put a doc string for the function. They have a dunder name, so you can change the name of the function. Uh, they are objects. And uh, this is something that is not true in a lot of other languages. And this is something that most Python coders would consider to be a really positive thing. So again, they, they are created in the codes, executed. They can have attributes. They can be assigned variables. They can be parameters and return values of other functions, which is how we get decorators. And I would love some time to talk about decorators, but uh, I know I'm kind of taking a lot of time anyhow. So I want to do one last thing as I wrap up. And that is also to do with functions. And this is something that I see fooling people all over the place. Uh, and that's default parameters. So when we have a function, we can give a parameter by name and give it a default value. And then if we don't, if we call the function without a parameter, it will use the default, right? Uh, if the class object is of type type, what then is the subclass of object? It's types all the way down. Uh, classes, subclasses, all of them are type. And it does kind of feel a little bit like a dog chasing its tail. That's the inspiration for the title of this talk, Objects All the Way Down, uh, because that refers to the old joke where somebody goes to the great religious sage and asks for the secret of the universe. And the sage says, uh, the world rests upon a giant turtle. And the guy says, well, so what's that turtle on? Another turtle. OK, well, what about that turtle? Another turtle. Well, okay, but what about, and like I said, look, it's turtles all the way down. That's the joke. That's what this talk is about. So yes, it's objects all the way down. So in any case, yeah, let me show you here. So again, no parameter. We use the default parameter. We use the parameter. Great. But what happens if our parameter is something like a list, which can be changed in place, and we change it? Okay, so people will do this and they'll see this and notice I print it out, then I add a high to it. Okay, and I can, you know, like do a separate run and that works fine. But now, what if I do it twice in a row? What prints out then? Okay, most people are going to think that I get two sets of empty brackets. OK, I don't. In fact, I get a high here. And where does that come from? Well, to show you, I can do this. I can do um, the ID number of x. So the ID function will give me the unique identifying number of, of an object. So if it's got the same number, it's the same object. I have two different objects. They have to have two different numbers. OK, so now let's see this. So now you can see, actually, start out with the one that ends in 87880. Uh, I do it again. I get 87880. That is, in fact, this object gets reused as a parameter, a default parameter, over and over and over again. So every time that I call this, if I append something onto the default, the next time I call it, the default will be different than what I think. Uh, so uh, this is because functions are objects that are created when their code is, is executed. That would make sense as objects. I already you know, said that earlier. Their default parameters are also objects which are created at the same time the function is created. That is, they don't keep recreating that default parameter. It gets done once when the function is created. If you can change that, if it's a mutable type, then it will change. If, you know, and that change will then be around the next time you want your default, uh, which is why 
better practice if you want to do something like that is to use something immutable like none as a as a flag and then i can say if x is none that is if i don't have a if i don't have a parameter then i want to use my my empty list uh, and then I can do this and I can run it over and over and over again. And every time I, I don't give it a parameter, it goes through this code, which in effect gives me a new list object. Uh, so, so that's, and, and I can prove it. Uh, there, see, I get two different empty list objects. So that's something, again, people don't understand, but it is a logical consequence of everything is an object, a function is an object, its default parameter is an object that's created at the same time the function gets created. It's the way it is. So um, that is what I've got. Like I say, everything is an object if it can stand by itself, basically. Punctuation, operators, keywords like def and class, those can't exist by themselves. Those will not be objects. Almost everything else, if you can have it kind of be on its own as an expression in Python, it's probably underneath it all going to be an object. So that's what I've got. Um, again, you can find the notebook at that link. And um, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I hope you got something out of it. All right, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to listen to your talk. I must uh, say that I was also uh, smiling to myself and just very happy at some, uh, yeah, at some parts when you say like, um, yeah, the Pythonistic opinionated way uh, to look at how Java is look at objects and this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. um, I also like turtles <laughs> and objects as well. <laughs> so I enjoyed that part. <laughs> um, it was really great to hear you. So let me just check the chat if we have any um, questions for you. You already get, uh, did a great job by uh, taking care of the first two questions better is one that I can ask to you. So uh, Pravan would like to know if our, uh, if meta classes are also objects. He says, I haven't used uh, meta classes before. Um, meta classes, right. but I've heard people talk about this on meetups. So where do you stand there? What do you think? Um... You know, I haven't actually gone through a bunch of examples lately, but meta classes uh, are, um, they're ways to kind of specify a different way for a class to behave. So in fact, um, meta classes are subclasses of type. So yeah, they're objects. It does come down to objects, it's, doesn't yep. it? <laughs> it's, all, it's all objects, yes. <laughs> That's great. OK, cool. So now we know about that. I also have a question. So if there is an object, does that mean I can create out of those objects an iterable? I'm thinking now specifically about functions. So if I have like function, let's say function, um, yeah. Uh, underscore one, function underscore two. Can I iterate and call those up, uh, functions this way in a for loop, for example? Does that work? Uh, you could put them into any sort of um, iterable that you wanted to. So you can make a list of functions. Uh, and right now they're talking about in addition to the language that will do something like it, but uh, Python doesn't have a switch case sort of statement. And the way we've always gotten around that is that you use your values as the keys and you use functions as the uh, as the as the value part of the of the switch statement. So you can actually put um, you know functions in as as the values in a dictionary too. So yeah, you can do all of that. You can have a list of functions and iterate over them. Definitely not a problem. Oh, that's great. I really like uh, how versatile Python is on this. Uh, and I will make sure to use this in my next, um, on my next code. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, or maybe you can better. find somebody I'm doing something that they don't understand what's going agreed, on. Agreed. No, maybe I'll test it first. Also see how my colleagues react first. And yes, then yes, yes. You might want to bring it up yeah, gently. Right. <laughs> I should also program for the reader, I have heard. So yeah, yes. that makes sense. <laughs> Just because Let's one yeah, can do something nice. doesn't mean you should, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. Everything that's possible, yeah, does, exactly, doesn't mean one should do it, right? 
Um, okay, cool. So that was really an amazing talk. Now I am, I think I learned more about objects. It was very exciting for me. Um, and uh, I think everyone in the audience are, is also super grateful that you joined us tonight. Um, so next time, if you want to see Naomi again, the next opportunity is on PyCon España, you said, um, which is happening on the 3rd of October. That's October the 3rd. Mm -hmm. I bet that's the next one. And yeah, so that's really cool. Uh, thank you so much. Is there anything you would like to add? Uh, nothing at all. Just um, everybody uh, in these times, stay safe. Try to stay in a good frame of mind. Uh, take care. Uh, and I hope I can meet some of you in person someday. We hope that too. Um, now that you mention it, I'm so sorry. I should have asked before, how is everything in Chicago? How are you? I see you're at home and staying safe. Right. I mean, in Chicago, the city, unlike large parts of the country, is reasonably well managed. So we have things open to a limited extent and the, the rate is not great, but fairly stable. So it's, it's, it's not bad, it's not bad. All right, uh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and to, well, so thank you so much. This has been lots of fun. Um, if you want to still stay here, uh, we're gonna hang around, we're gonna hang um, out with all everyone else then later again. And um, so please feel free to stay later. Um, yeah, and okay. I guess- Well, thank you. That's, yeah. So thank you so much. And please do write if you're in Munich, the beer offer stands. <laughs> okay, I will keep that in All mind. Right. <laughs> okay, That's thank great. you. Thanks, Naomi. See you later. Bye bye. Okay, so uh, for our next talk, I have someone very special with me. She has also been a pie lady for Munich um, even longer than I have so she's the experienced one right here and I'm super happy to have her here uh, she just finished her um, her bachelor thesis and now in is gonna uh, tell us about her new adventures and she has prepared a very interesting talk before but before that so Olga please roll into the screen with me <laughs> and an applause <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. I'm happy <laughs> to roll into you. Um, I hope you are doing well and um, enjoying this summer. Even uh, this is actual situation with uh, Corona. I hope everybody is safe. And I'm happy that you are here tonight with us. Or maybe not tonight. Uh, depends on the day now. <laughs> That's right. So um, actually, as a matter of fact, if you're joining us from somewhere else, please um, tell us in the comments. We would like to uh, send you some servos from Munich. <laughs> All right. So, um, oh, yeah, you have prepared some really nice talk about, um, yeah, some really nice talk tonight. Um, I don't want to say too much about it because you're about to tell us more. But um, is there anything you would like to like to give us as a um, teaser before you start? Um, well, um, maybe you already read the description of the meetup. Um, today I will talk about um, interpretability with sharp framework and uh, we will discuss this uh, exciting uh, machine learning, deep learning related topic. And I hope it will be very good and very fun. And I'm happy here to uh, make this talk and to answer all the questions you might have. That's great. I'm very excited already. So I just before we start, Olya told me very important news about something big that happened yesterday. And this is good news, people, so bear with me. Uh, so yesterday, Python 3.10 uh, was released. So if you haven't uh, switched to Python 3, there's yet another reason to do so. Um, and well, then without further ado, then please all, all welcome Olya and her talk. <laughs> okay, see you guys. I'm rolling back to my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> so tonight, this is the tricky part of the, of the meetup where we're going to switch to Olya. Uh, to her screen. So for now, I say goodbye. I'm going to mute myself and see you on the other side after the talk.
Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, that's great. I just need a moment, I need to restart something. So, Andrea, maybe you could um, say hi from Munich to someone. Hi. Okay. Which locations do we have today? <laughs> um, can you mute yourself for that? And I will ask if you mute it later. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, all right, as I've told you before, this is a tricky part of the meetup where um, this is actually, I think it's quite funny that on an online meetup, the tricky part is sitting in the same uh, office and in the same room. So, but bear with us and we're gonna go, uh, we just need to restart a few things and then we will be ready to go. Um, all right, so let me see if anyone who is not in Munich is joining today. So hello, Ines, uh, servus to Berlin. <laughs> That's great that you're joining. Wow, we even have Alexander from Brazil. This is quite amazing. Um, let us know where from Brazil are you joining? Our um, dear old Pi Ladies organizer, Laisa, is also from Brazil. She'll probably also say hello in the chat, uh, although she's not in Brazil right now, but um, I'm very happy and I'm sure that she's also very happy to see that there's more people from Brazil joining. That's great. Um, now let me also check. All right. so. I see that you can actually hear me. That's great. Uh, hello, Danka from Serbia. That's so cool. Such an international meetup today. I am very happy to see that. Um, and let me see. So that's really cool. Um, also, I have a question for the audience as well. Um, so now that we have Python 3, I don't know, is anyone here in the room? I will stop finger pointing right now. Who is still not using Python 3? And if so, like, why do you think is this? The, is the, um, what do you think is like the, the most uh, difficult part to switch into Python 3? Do you think it's more of an uh, organizational stuff on um, where you work or is it um, a technical issue? Let us know in the comments. Um, all right, so that's really cool. I see there's lots of people in the chat um, right now. And also let us know if you would like now to, if you have been thinking about starting an open source project or starting any kind of project, uh, start using Python. Um, if there's anything that you will apply that you learned today about objects. I myself actually uh, was very curious to know if the functions are actually objects. And I'm very happy that Naomi uh, solved that um, question for me. And now I will, I will try at home with care, very um, carefully before, before I then, um, before I break anything <laughs> for my colleagues. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. Um, but I think it's really cool that we have this um, great responsibility and great power in Python. Okay. So we're good to go. I have the thumbs up of Olya. So have hello again. Can you hear me now? 
Okay, that's great. I'm delighted to be here today to introduce you my talk about interpretability with Sharp Framework. Um, I'm from Yekaterinburg, Russia, and I'm living currently in Munich, Germany. I'm studying at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Master now and working by Siemens as working student. I'm also an official organizer of PyLadies Munich meetup, and in my free time you can find me coding, traveling, or dancing bachata. Well, I just defended my bachelor thesis um, two months ago, and I will show you my project, which I did. Next slide will be my live demo. I studied the problem of predicting user personality based on user essays, and I also did some um, interpretable deep learning to predict uh, user personality and to do explanations. I will show you the program. User can write the text, then submit submit the text. After that, um, users will receive a personality profile and uh, also can read information about personality traits. And now, after clicking on Curious Why button, user will be redirected to explanations page, where it will be explained why algorithm or model uh, defined user like this kind of personality. If you want to know how I did it and what I use, I will tell you. I will tell you later. Uh, but first of all, okay. Actually, I thought I did it. There. Okay, finally. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah. It's the program which I told you about. Yeah, user can write the essay, then user will receive the prediction of personality, like I already said. This personality profile with information about uh, personality traits. And um, in the end, if user is curious, um, we can get some explanations how algorithm uh, detected uh, the personality based on which features. That's short information about this project. And if you are curious why and how I did it, um, I will tell you now. Um, sorry for this uh, short interruption. Uh, first, I would like to give you a brief introduction of my talk. Um, first of all, we will talk about motivation, then we will talk about uh, interpretability types and about uh, sharp framework and examples of using it. So why do we need to explain machine learning for deep learning models? The first reason is uh, to detect biases. Experiences in the past, like what happened with Amazon, where secret artificial intelligence recruiting tool showed bias against women showed the importance of interpreting complex models. Second reason why do we need to explain machine learning models is for sure debugging. Um, lack of transparency behind behaviors of machine learning and deep learning models leaves user and machine, learnings, uh, machine learning engineers in perplexity as how to particular decisions were made uh, by these models. And the third reason we need uh, to explain machine learning models to achieve the trust of users. Um, I need to say that general data protection regulation um, carries privacy requirements, uh, including the right of user to explanation. So the most important question is why? We always have some input, we always have some output, but what is happening by algorithm? We don't know how this decisions are made, it's like black box for us. And if we ask uh, the model, what is the answer on everything? And we will receive the answer 42. We don't know why and how this decision was made. And interpretability 
allows us uh, to know why and answer this question. There are two types of explanations, intrinsic interpretability and post hoc interpretability. Intrinsic interpretability is achieved by constructing interpretable models which incorporate interpretability within their structures. And subcategories uh, of interpretable models are linear regression model, decision tree, uh, logistic regression, and many others. To post hoc interpretability belong um, model which are created uh, to grant explanations for any type of existing models. And this model is like already second model. At the moment, they are available such methods like Lime, Sharp, and some others. And uh, my talk will be about Sharp. Sharp framework is based on Sharply values. Uh, Sharply value is a method from coalitional game theory, which tells us the average of all the marginal contributions to all possible coalitions. If you are interested in theory behind that, you can read the papers. I will post the link uh, to my slides and you can find information there. Sharp framework or sharply additive explanations written in Python. It could be applied for any machine or deep learning model and it shows the impact of each feature on the prediction. It's a united approach and uh, provides global and local consistency and interpretability. To install Sharp, you don't need too much. You can use just normal pip or conda. What do you like more? Maybe you can write in the comments uh, in YouTube stream um, what do you prefer. It will be interesting to know. And there are many types of sharp explainers, gradient explainer, deep explainer, kernel explainer, sampling explainer, partition explainer, and three explainer. I will make the examples for gradient explainer and deep explainer. Gradient explainer is um, a model, post hoc interpretability model, which is created um, to interpret um, output for some models which are related to image recognition. And deep explainer is interpretability model, which is um, which is carrying out uh, the output of deep learning models. Now you can see my first example. On the right side, you can see the code. And the most important parts are red. Um, and on the left side, you can see prediction for two input images. Um, and in this plot, you can see that red pixels represent positive um, sharp values, which are most important for predicting that um, this animal is a doverture or this bird. And here you can see also that these red pixels were most relevant to detect that it was a new cat. My examples you can find on the official page of sharp framework. And second example will be from my bachelor thesis. Like I already said, I studied how texts written by users can manifest their personality and how we can predict uh, big five personality traits. For the training of my deep learning model, I used a um, widely exploited um, data set from James Pennebacher and Laura King, which consists of uh, 2,467 essays written by users in controlled environment. Uh, you can see here this data set actually the head of this data set, um, there are seven columns. First is author ID, second one is uh, text written by this user, and um, the last five columns are labels of personality, extraversion, neurotism, agreeableness, consciousness, and openness. If you see here N, it means no. If you see here Y, it means yes. So for example, if here you can see and by extraversion label, it means that the person is not extrovert, but introvert. And if you see here a Y by neurotism, it means that a person is neurotic. So my question is, 
Do you believe in magic? If you don't, I will make you believe. I will show you how to make explanations with Sharp just in three lines of code. Are you ready for that? We will switch now to my Jupyter notebook. Basically, I created here the deep learning model, LSTM, bidirectional model. It doesn't matter for us. Um, here, you can find the most important lines of code. Um, we just import the Sharp framework. Then we um, initiate Deep Explainer. Since I used a deep learning model, I used Deep Explainer for that. And we initiate it with um, existing uh, LST model and um, trained um, like a training data set. Number of explanations in this case are 15. And uh, here we're just extracting our sharp values, basically. And now I will show you the global interpretability method summary plot. You can see here on the screen, for example, word like is mostly contributing to openness prediction. And uh, the second uh, example here is word happen. What happened mostly contributing to prediction of neurotism, but it's also um, contributing a lot to prediction of openness. So probably the open people would use a lot of what happen and, and neurotic people as well. Yes, I just saved these uh, sharp values that I could use it later in my web platform. And here you can see some examples. I just uh, made the point of typical for label and untypical for label words. And um, yes, and created uh, as a word cloud with that. And that's all, actually. But I wanted to say for sure that there are some steps before and after. We need to import data first. We need to do some data processing with removing special characters, uh, stop words, etc. Then you need to do data exploration, transform word into word embeddings, then create of LSTM network for personality prediction, evaluate it, and repeat the step till you will find the best model. After that, you can do the interpretability step. But after testing, I found out that it's not possible to create interpretability um, interpretability model with Sharp because uh, con computations were interrupted. That's why I needed to go back and create some other models and test it out if it works or not. So I need to create some light white model in this case. And as I could create it, I could implement uh, my explanatory user interface, which I showed you in the beginning of my talk, which I did with uh, Flask framework. That were two restrictions which I found out Sharp Deep Explainer works at the moment just with TensorFlow 1, which is quite old and can cause also some problems. And uh, Sharp values computational costs are very high, like I already said. Um, it was not possible to create explanation with Sharp with the best model because of hardware restrictions. And for this reason, I needed to create more simple personality prediction model. Last but not least, if you are doing some machine learning or deep learning, you always have to be careful because it not, um, it's not so simple like it looks like normally. And there are always some um, hided, hided things which you need to consider. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer your questions you might have. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Olga. Um, let me also join with image so you don't feel like it's your conscious uh, talking to you. <laughs> All right. So 
Um, that was a really cool talk. And now I actually think I want to know more or even try it on myself. But first of all, our audience might have some questions. And for this, I would kindly ask Olya if she would yet again roll over here and um, answer some questions. <laughs> All right, so let's check the, let's take a look at the chat, uh, at the chat first. We have lots of great feedback. Um, so Eduardo also was using the um, uh, Shapley framework as well, if I understood mm -hmm. correctly. And there's uh, many people that are interested even on your um, code. So mm -hmm. uh, you also already showed uh, the repository where, where we can find um, out more, right? Mm -hmm. And this is really cool. So let me check. I think you explained everything so well. No one is having questions. Uh, okay. Everyone is just very happy and um, yeah, appreciating the magic. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's really cool. So yeah, Patron writes me to my office colleagues asking how my code works. It's all magic. Is this how you explain? <laughs> yes, it's just magic sometimes. That's great. But you also uh, now we also know how to be magicians as well. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so you were telling me also about like the newest release of Python before and you did just this one project right now. Mm -hmm. And it seems uh, like you did a really cool work right there. It's mm -hmm. super interesting. Um, I have so many questions. I need to sort them out. So first, um, do you have any like now new project in mind that you would like to do next with Python? Um, maybe also with the Chapel explanations or, or you uh, like some other NLP? P stuff mm -hmm. or um, what are you thinking or now that the release came is like oh yeah this is the feature I was always waiting for what do you say to that <laughs> well I'm just um, excited to wait uh, till a uh, sharp framework will support uh, TensorFlow 2 for deep explain uh, deep, deep explainer I think it's it will be really cool because um, like I already said uh, TensorFlow 1 is already out outdated a bit <laughs> but it's okay um i mean uh, you can use for example gradient explainer with tensorflow tool it's just not available for uh deep explainer at the moment and so uh, yeah i really like uh, to use um, deep learning and machine learning and um, i have um I have now some project uh, in Kotlin, so <laughs> sorry guys, I, I, I just uh, moved a bit uh, uh, for some time to Kotlin, but um, I will be probably back uh, to my NLP, machine learning, deep learning stuff uh, very soon. That's cool. Maybe you also uh, tell us in the future more about that. I'm sure that I'm not the only one who is curious now. <laughs> That's really cool, Olga. Thank you so much. So people, please use Python 3 and TensorFlow 2 at least. <laughs> so, um, all right, that's great. I also have a question. So I think this um, kind of personality test out of your text um, mm -hmm. is very interesting. Um, do you know like any any um, yeah ways or any uh, field where this is already being used for something? Um, Yes, um, like uh, personality prediction is used a lot in marketing field. For example, people with different personality will react differently on different kind of uh, reclaim. For example, uh, introverted people are tended maybe uh, more to, uh, to to some kind of other pictures because I I I I saw some project where it was like. Um, some personality prediction project uh, based on uh, pictures which people liked and mostly extroverted people liked a lot of pictures with other people and introverted people mostly liked some pictures with nature or some uh, architecture like with some more neutral uh, more neutral background and I think probably for marketing uh, purposes it's important to know uh, how the people think uh, and um, for sure they are 
many interesting projects as well, I think. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, I wouldn't have thought of that use case. I think every time that uh, people talk about personalities, I'm kind of the person that goes very into, oh yeah, they're talking about individuals. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as a marketing strategy, that uh, very much makes sense. So that's really cool. Thank you so much. Uh, let me check on the chat if there's any other questions. So, all right. What would you propose for bias mitigations? Well, um, I, I will propose if you have time and you have the capacity, maybe to use um, some interpretability techniques uh, to detect some biases and uh, it could be very, very helpful. Like maybe not sharp frameworks, there yeah, are many other methods and um, just test out how is it working because like experiences in the past um, showed that it's important uh, uh, what your data you actually have it could cause some problems in yeah, the future. Definitely. I think explainability of models um, plays a very big role on that one. Like trying to explain why our models act some way um, might also help us explain where some models uh, might be biased or not at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's of course about the data, but I guess um, also about the tools themselves, right? So mm -hmm. uh, since they are also very often based on some other data. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, that's very cool. So thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. Oh yeah, I, and thank you everyone in the audience who has who stuck uh, with us so far. I just see the question from Barbara. Ah, Dear yeah. Barbara, um, if you are interested, you can uh, write me a DM maybe and I will send it to you. Maybe I will publish it because it's in some private <laughs> repository till now. But Ah, that's great. So Barbara it. asks, is the Jupyter Notebook somewhere available on GitHub or so? Mm -hmm. um, all right. So please, Barbara, Barbara uh, feel free to contact free us to or contact, contact Olya. Contact me um, send it to you. That's right. So Or maybe I will make it public, but I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe you can convince her. Yes. And on the note of convincing Olga <laughs> to make the Jupyter Notebook um, available. So we have come to the set end of our meetup tonight. Uh, we were very happy to have you all here. And um, I'm very happy. Yeah, I'm grateful for each speaker. So thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Olga, again. It was really excited and it was very entertaining to hear um, about your projects. And also thank you again to Nina from Alaska uh, for also being here with us and letting us stay at this great location right in the middle of the city of Munich so that we come to you at home. <laughs> um, all right, so now we're gonna end the official streaming. Um, after that, I'm also gonna post um, the background Zoom meeting we have been um, on all the way for now. Uh, so if you want to join and hang out with us um, as part of like out of the stream, <laughs> so and then like a rather unofficial um, later part of the event uh, or the informal part, let's call it like that. Um, yeah, please feel free to join. I'm gonna post this link now so you can, um, yeah, so you can join us. So here you go. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I see Pratvani saying hello. Um, so thank you, Pelivis Munich, for organizing the meetup with great talks, talks from India. Wow, all the way from India. Thank you so much and stay safe as well. Uh, lovely to have you here and I wish you a good night. Thank you for uh, taking the time so late <laughs> to be with us here. So, all right, everyone who wants to join, I'll see you there. And um, other than that, this is it and stay safe. Bye. Bye.